Up next, Tim, uh, jumping again, a whole year ahead, May of 2011, Kenneth Bragna's Thor. I rolled my eyes when I heard that they were making this movie. I'm like, how can you make a movie about a god interesting? But my writing god, J. Michael Straczynski, uh, wrote it. And of the first wave of Marvel movies, this one is my favorite. Wow. It, it's, it is not a complex story. It is the most basic story ever, a god gets cast down to earth and forced to, you know, learns to be humble and, you know, and then reattains his place in, in the heavens. Uh, is it breaking any new ground? No, but I love it. It's big, it's gaudy and theatrical, and I love every minute of it. I might owe myself a revisit to this one, so I'll <laughs> keep, I won't talk at length about it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I did see it, of course. Um, it was one of those films uh, that, you know, you see... Uh, and for me, it was relatively forgettable after. Like you kind of like you could have asked me like an hour later, like what happened that last scene, and I would have to try to recall and maybe struggle and oh. say, oh well, I think so. I still couldn't tell you what happened in the final act. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I can't sure, tell you much what I'm happened. Sure I, I know Natalie Portman. Something with this guy. Natalie Portman comes up. I remember when the trailer first hit, and there was a line from Anthony Hopkins that I liked and quoted, and like I was mm -hmm. kind of all on board with it. Um, I did not see this one theatrically, one of the few I missed out on the big screen. I did catch up with it on... You were probably still better Ray. about uh, Green Lantern, because that was about the same time those Ooh. two hit. The, I remember at the same time, uh, at that time thinking, Thor's going to be stupid, Green Lantern's going to be good, and ooh, I could not have been more wrong. Yeah, you, maybe maybe that was... So Thor, uh, like I said, I, I don't have a strong opinion on it. Mm -hmm. I did see it, uh, kind of just went in and out. Mm -hmm. um, Let's jump ahead to one that has a little bit more personality, perhaps. Mm -hmm. July of that same year, 2011, Captain America, the first Avenger, mm -hmm. Joe Johnston at the helm. Oh, yeah. I, I really enjoyed this one. Yes. Uh, it's another one where, again, I'm not completely certain what happened in the third act. <laughs> uh, I mean, obviously, we know that he, you know, self-sacrifices and crashes the planes. I'm just talking slightly before that, when Red Skull gets sucked into a thing. <laughs> yeah. Is he dead? Is he alive? Is he in well, some sort of There's a lot of things storage? that, you know, when you start getting the cosmic cubes and whatnot, mm -hmm. there's quite a bit of... Yeah, I don't know what the rules are exactly. Right. Uh, but again, first act, you know, uh, I, I felt that, you know, they could not have made Steve Rogers more, more likable if they tried. Um, Chris I'm, Evans. Yeah, Chris Evans completely redeemed himself from the uh, Fantastic Four movies, and yeah. You've got uh, Hugo Weaving as the Red Skull. Always good, yeah. And actually, uh, Haley At Atwell, who played Peggy Carter, mm -hmm. uh, really, uh, to me, was a highlight in this film. I thought oh, she yeah. was quite good. I haven't seen her really used to uh, the best of her capabilities since then, but she was quite good at that. Yeah. So Captain America, it, it, you know, Captain America takes place in the past. This film mm -hmm. felt of a whole. Like, it felt like it lived in. It felt like, you know, it's a period film. Yeah, yeah. And um, I, I think they, uh, yeah, I'm on board with that one. Yeah, yeah. We're going to go a year down the road, May of 2012, and this is the last film of Phase 1. Yes. Marvel's The Avengers. Mm -hmm. Josh Whedon, man. Let us know what you thought, Tim. Biggest, one of the biggest highly anticipated films in kind of our geek culture, which is now, again, we said sort of predominant culture, uh, ever. Mm -hmm. Like, the buzz on this thing was huge. Um, it movie, made a ton of money. Movie critic Bob Chipman uh, used to work for The Escapist as Movie Bob. Um, pretty much everything that he said about this movie I agree with. Is it a great cinematic classic? No. It is Galaga the movie. <laughs> but there were enough character moments in it where... You know, each character was given their moment to shine. You got that moment of, you know, you get to find out what would happen if, you know, Iron Man were to try to fight, you know, Thor, and, you know, you get all the verses that you want. Was it a great movie? No, but it was a victory lap, and I cheered, and it, actually, it's funny, because uh, that, that moment uh, when New York is blowing up and you have all the Avengers together... I got goosebumps at that moment when the, the camera, you know, does the little pan around them and they all do their little action-y pose, and I'm kind of... Mm -hmm. It was that moment, because I've been kind of arguing with people uh, against the idea of having a group of costumed heroes, going, that would look silly, because I, I was arguing with people... You remember how the X-Men looked in the, uh, the first X-Men movie? Yep. They were kind of... They were almost Tim Burtonized, you know? I'm like, y yeah, you have to do that. You can't do uh, those costumes, and that movie did it, and it worked, and it was just that moment, oh, 
you can do this. <laughs> yeah, you know, we talked about the house style and the color schemes too. Like the Avengers, they do have a particular look. They mm -hmm. interpreted them and adapted them from the comic books, mm -hmm. kind of giving them a little bit of a sheen. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, it was interesting seeing all these characters on screen together. And, and, just and a, I'm gonna interrupt for one second. Side, side diatribe, my favorite TV show from my childhood, Captain Tower and the Soldiers of the Future. I showed it to my friend Robert, and there, there's a, a remake in the works called Phoenix Rising. Um, my friend Robert looks at the, the power suits they're wearing, and he's like, my god, even, uh, e even Freddie Mercury would be saying, that is loud, my friend. Oh. There's no way that those things would work. And when I saw that, that moment in Avengers, the other thought that went to my head was, I think Captain Power might work now. Uh -uh. You, you could pull that back out, but I saw, I'm sorry to interrupt. No, 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 no. Um, yeah, the Avengers, you know, the first thing that I saw in the theater, um, I wouldn't say I necessarily felt triumphant. Um, you know, a bit exhilarated, maybe. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Like, I never had a rousing moment where I jumped out of my chair and spilled mm -hmm. the guy next to me's popcorn. But um, <laughs> I, I mostly enjoyed it. There's the good moment that everybody thinks of. You know, I'm a big Hulk fan, my all-time favorite comic book character, the Incredible Hulk, yeah, where he yeah. grabs Loki like a puny, you know, like a french fry and, and, and bangs him around. So, you know, the first Avengers, I think now, in retrospect, because I've seen the second Avengers, mm -hmm. I, it kind of makes me appreciate the uh, first Avengers a touch more. Mm -hmm. Whereas before, I wasn't super high on it, yeah, yeah. Um, relatively inoffensive, um, but now, in the wake of Age of Ultron, I kind of like it maybe a little bit more. I hear more. Can I get so, you pause for just one second? Is that still rolling? Looks like it might be off. It died. Oh, damn. All right, we're dependent on you, sir. <coughs> All right, phase one is down. Um, best and worst film of phase one. Ooh, well, okay, my... my f Damn, that's a difficult question to answer. I know, I put you right on the spot. Because, I'll go I'll, first. Okay, go ahead. Captain America, the first adventure, would be my favorite. <laughs> Probably Iron Man 2 for my least favorite. Okay. Well, and, and Captain America, uh, again, uh, hit, that and the first Iron Man are pretty neck and neck. I'll yeah, say yeah. that. That would be my runner-up. See, uh, to me, you get two different answers, two different, two different things. Which is my favorite and which is the best. My favorite is Thor. I consider Captain America the best. I like that. Um, worst, uh, I have to say, probably Incredible Hulk. So, Let's jump ahead into Phase 2. Phase 2 is where it started to lose me. Okay, yeah, so we need Although, to we need to address that, because yeah. thus far there have been five, and there's a six uh, days away. Um, May of 2013, Iron Man 3, Shane Black steps in. Oh, I, I, I loved this movie so much, I can't even... Uh, and, and you're talking about, you know, where's the director's stamp? This one, you know, it has everything a Shane Black movie has. It's set at Christmas time. It's about a guy finding himself. There's the little kid, you know, it's it's just, and we get to, you know, Iron Man has to discover that he can, he is Iron Man, you know, he has value without his toys. So it's, it's kind of an existential struggle. Uh, I loved the twist with uh, the Mandarin, because I remember seeing the ads going, hell are you going to make the Mandarin work now? Right. And, and they went in a completely different way than I don't think anybody could have predicted. Yeah, that that was awesome. Just the greatest thing ever. It's one of those the, things that, like, if you didn't see the movie early into its run, you would have inevitably had it spoiled for you. And I yeah. can't imagine seeing it, not, you know, having that ruined. But um, the whole extremist thing, uh, again... I don't understand the ending. I don't understand why Guy Pierce. These extremist guys are designed to explode and pull themselves back together. I don't know why the explosion at the end took when all the others didn't. Uh, what would you say about the, the child and his time spent uh, under Tony Stark's care? Was he too precocious? Uh, was it a little too schmaltzy for you? or? Uh, you know, so far as, a, as annoying kids go, he wasn't that annoying and... and it's funny, because I actually got into an argument about my, with my dad about this one, because my dad didn't like this movie all that much, and one of the reasons he didn't like the movie is because uh, Tony Stark did not assume a fatherly role, did not really guide the child, and I'm going, Stark is not 
you know, fatherly sort of character. He's very self-centered. He's very, you know, he he couldn't be that guy. And yeah. I thought, yeah, I thought it was appropriate for the character the way he behaved. Um, and yeah, I didn't mind the kid. I agree. You, your parents sound very moral moviegoers. Yes. Uh, Iron Man 3, I liked it a lot, too. Mm -hmm. And I remember kind of feeling like the outlier, the, the minority. Mm -hmm. I got online, a lot of my friends that were into the Marvel and comic book films were sort of down on it. Mm -hmm. uh, I had quite a lot of fun in the theater. And again, maybe because I like, you know, I mentioned before, I like the first act of most of these movies way more than the second or third. Mm -hmm. um, because they're usually the most about the characters, about the people that are behind the mask and such. Yeah. Maybe that's why I kind of liked this one, because it was a much as a, a Tony Stark movie than it was... A fully clad Iron Man film. Yeah. Um, I haven't seen it since originally saw it, but at the time I was quite pleased with it. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> uh, a fall release to November of 2013 for The Dark World. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <sighs> a lot of people loved this movie. Um, I really was not one of them. I mean, it. <sighs> You know, it's funny, because I, I am a fantasy fan, but it starts out with... Okay, I am of the opinion that when you start out with a prologue, and it starts with, you know, many a years ago, the draw elves of Koopa Keep and do whatever the hell oh, and position. stuff like that, I'm like, okay, I am gradually pulling out of this, this movie at all together. Um, I, I didn't mind... Uh, a lot of people complained about the, the girl from Two Broke Girls. Uh, I forget her name. You know, they, they said she wasn't funny or whatever. I didn't mind her, but I... And I felt bad for Christopher Eccleston, because, you know, he left Doctor Who. He's, you know, the main villain in this movie, and you could have put anyone mm -hmm. in the world under that makeup. He doesn't even get to speak English lines most of the time. He's just that fictional, you know, dark elf language. I remember even thinking the title of the dark world. that Could you get more generic than that? Yeah. Uh, the, the moments of sunshine in this movie were Loki. His, his few moments on screen were the moments where he was like, ah, oh, thank you. <laughs> you know? some personality into the affair. Yeah, the ending, I don't know what happened in the ending. They, they put the magic sticks and they did things and things happened and portals open and portals close and planets merge and unmerge and stuff happens and I don't know what happened. The ending happened and everyone won somehow. <laughs> you know, uh, similar to the first Thor film, both of them I saw and mm -hmm. they didn't stick with me. Yeah. And I don't know if that's a problem with the films that I can point to or maybe a problem with me. Mm -hmm. But this one I know on the surface I was anticipating more because it did seem far out. Literally and figuratively because, you know, Thor travels through space. You know, he lets that Molnir, or he lets it fly, his hammer. Mm -hmm. He hangs on, and he can be an interdimensional traveler and stuff. Mm -hmm. This one promised, and some of the production art that leaked, and some of the early stills, mm -hmm. you know, there's going to be monsters and creatures and things of mythical proportions from other worlds. I like the idea of traveling on this rainbow bridge and all that weird sci-fi shit yeah. that people that aren't too familiar with Thor mm -hmm. might not be aware of. Did the film successfully do it, bring us there? I... Don't know if I could say that. Mm -hmm. The director, um, <laughs> Alan Taylor, and don't be uh, remiss if you don't recognize the name because he hasn't done too much work actually. He took about a, uh, he did a Emperor's New Clothes in 2001, uh, Ian Holm playing Napoleon. Um, 2003, he did a film called Kill the Poor for IFC. Then he took off a decade, 10 years, no work comes back and does Thor in the Dark World. Where do they find this guy? You know what that sounds like? Somebody's to... agent like owes somebody uh, and apparently, uh, well not apparently, when this video airs uh, he will, this will already be out in the multiplexes. He's doing this summer's Terminator Genesis. Interesting. So... Oh, that doesn't fill me with hope. He's done some television work and some other stuff, but mm -hmm. uh... To me, that a couple almost, episodes that, of Sopranos? That almost screams ghost director, like... Mm -hmm. You know, someone else was directing the movie, and they're like, hey, you're taking credit for it, or something like I'm that. I'm scrolling through his filmography, and yeah, he's done one to two to three episodes on just about every popular TV show. Just going to name a couple. Game of Thrones, Boardwalk Empire, Mad Men, Big Love, Rome, Lost, Deadwood, Six Feet Under, West Wing, uh, I had said Sopranos earlier, even Sex in the City. 
Oz. So yeah, wow, that's pretty that's... much like, you know, to, to some people that may be the top 20 television shows of the past 20 years. Well, it's also funny because television journeyman. directors are not like movie directors. I sure, mean, different, it, yeah, way different. Uh... Yeah, usually you, you wander on set, you have no idea what's going on, you, you kind of rely on the cast to kind of tell you this is the tone we have, this is how we do things. <laughs> You're really director in name only. It's why so often on TV shows the cast tends to step up in the leadership roles because they have the most vested interest in those sorts of things. So I suppose in that sense you're, you're accusing the uh, the MCU of being a bit lifeless, a bit you know let's just maintain the status quo. Well, I can't think of a director more more suited towards that if that's you know what his background is. So let me put it to this way: mm -hmm. Would you skip this film, or is it worthy of a revisit? Uh, or for some people, a first-time view. But is it is it one that you can do without, or is it one that might be worthy of a relook, a second look? As a movie, I say skip it. <coughs> However, in terms of continuity, you know there are important things that occur in this movie with uh, you know Anthony Hopkins and Loki. You know, yeah. so it's one of those things you can't one hundred percent skip it. But then again, maybe if you did, you could. Imagine that something, some better, something better happened as to why Loki was able to, you know, supplant uh, Odin. Let's jump to the not too distant past, April fourth of twenty fourteen. Captain America: The Winter Soldier. Tim, I want to let you know 